Good morning, Southside. Welcome on this Mother's Day. And a special welcome to all of the mothers who are watching, listening today. Whether you're a mother with kids at home, a grandmother with kids that you take care of or worry about and pray about, whether you are a mother with pain in her life for various reasons, whether you're a person who is a mother in Israel, as they say, where uh, they're not children that you would say are yours biologically, but they're children that you are influencing in many, many ways. So whoever you are as a mother, welcome today, and may God really bless you today, uh, that it may be a day of happiness, a day of fulfillment, and a day of God's blessing in your life.
Southside. Happy Mother's Day. And today that's our lesson. It's about Mother's Day. We're going to talk a little bit about how Mother's Day got started and how Mother's Day is actually talked about in the Bible. Well, not Mother's Day per se, but mothers and how God loves them. First, I'd like to thank some people named uh, Darren and Leanne. They have a website called DLTK and I've been using it for years, teaching children Bible, Bible stories, Sunday school. And also I use it in my day job, which is in the kindergarten classroom. So, and I ran a home daycare and I used it then. So I've been using this website for years and they have given us permission to use their materials today for this lesson and any lesson during this pandemic. So that was very kind to them and we'd like to thank them very much and offer a special blessing to them as well. Um, their website is on the slides. So if you as a mom or a dad or a teacher or anybody who's listening would like to check them out, I recommend it 100% and thank them. Okay, let's get to it. So how did Mother's Day get started? So people started to honor this day for honoring mothers and it was called Mothering Sunday. It's the It was the fourth Sunday in Lent in the United Kingdom, other countries. It's still that way in the United Kingdom, but in Canada and the United States, we have a day called Mother's Day. And it's on the second Sunday of May every year, which is today. 150 years ago, a woman by the name of Anna Jarvis, and that's a picture of her. She wanted to raise awareness about the poor health conditions of mothers. And she believed that other women would want to be aware of this too. And she was an activist, which meant that she was strong in her beliefs and she talked about them and, and tried to make change. She wanted everyone to understand how hard work it was to keep your family safe, fed, healthy, and happy. And she called this day Mother's Work Day. The day was supposed to be a rest for uh, working mothers, a day to rest, relax, take a break. After she died, her daughter, who was also named Anna, she wanted to honor all that her mother did. And she um, heard her mother say that she wanted to make it a special day one day. So she tried to do that for her. She talked to lots of people and she got um, a president by the name of Woodrow Wilson. So that's presidents in the United States to sign a bill recognizing Mother's Day and it became a national holiday. So white carnations are kind of like the flower we see um handed out at mother's day or uh, you'll see them in stores there'll be white roses or white carnations um 
lots of different white flowers for Mother's Day. And that was Anna's mother's favorite flower. The thing is, though, that as years went by, Anna didn't really like how it turned out. She didn't want it to be all about buying big presents and, you know, that kind of thing. She wanted it to be a break for the mom. So make cards. So here's a couple of pictures and examples of some little cards that you could make homemade. She wanted people to clean up that day or um, thank their mom for, for all that she does. So let's talk for a minute about the Bible and Mother's Day. The fifth commandment is called people refer to sometimes as the fifth commandment is the commandment with a promise. But we're going to talk about the beginning of the commandment. It's um, honor thy father and thy mother. So those are words from God. So God's saying, honor your mother and your father. So what does honor mean? So here's five things that you can think that uh, you, you might have other words. And if we were together, we could really talk about these different words. But here's five. Listen, obey, love, appreciate, forgive. Those are five words that could describe honor. So listen to what your mom says. Obey. Do what she says right away with a smile on your face. That's very important. You know, don't argue with your mother. Just listen to her and obey her. Love her. Show her you love her. There's lots of different ways you can do that. You can hug her. You can tell her. You can do something that she really likes. Appreciate. Oh, this is a big one, folks. Say thank you. Let her know that the things that she does, you really appreciate. Like when you go in your room and you see there's clean clothes all folded and put in your drawers, feel that love and, and, and appreciate your mom for doing that and say thank you and forgive her. Because you know what? Moms are humans. They're, they're human beings and they make mistakes. So forgive moms. Don't hold grudges. Okay. So that was the five things that describe honor. So we're going to talk about something that you can make your mom. Okay. And this is called a bouquet of hands. So you can take your hand and you can trace it on a piece of paper and cut it out. And then you can take the fingertips and you can color them and write things on them. This one, I wrote the word honor. And on each of my fingers, I have the five words that we just talked about. Listen, obey, love, appreciate, and forgive. So once you finish that, then you take the bottom part and you roll it up like this and you put a piece of tape on it. But leave a little hole. See the little hole there? Do you see that? And you can just fit a pencil into there. You can put it in your in a jar make a little bouquet this one i kind of decorated very quick just so i could show you but it's the same kind of thing so then you can give your mom that and it's a bouquet of flowers but they're your hands how cool is that so that's a nice little activity that you can do so here's another part in the bible where god talks about mothers her children arise and call her blessed that's in proverbs so I, I decided I'm going to look up the word blessed. So why not? We looked, we, we decided what honor was. And now let's look up blessed. The definition of blessed, okay, it says highly favored, made holy, happiness, good fortune, health, love, belonging to or associated with a divine power. What's the divine power? God, right? God's the divine power. So guess what? Moms belong to the divine power. God, God, he, we all belong to God, right? And your mother is one of us. She belongs to God. Okay, so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what we've just learned. We're going to just sum it up a little bit. So the memory verse that you could study this week is her children arise up and call her blessed. Think about that. You are her children. So make her feel blessed. Make her feel honored. Take this week and choose something to do, maybe every day. Offer to set the table, clean your room, tidy things up, put away your shoes, do things that she would appreciate because then, you know, it shows you appreciate her. So here's the um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, but it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, because here's the promise. 
Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in land. There you go. So God is saying, honor your mother and father and, and you will live long in the land. Because you'll have a nice life if you treat your mother nice, kind, loving, appreciative. All those things. So honor her, call her blessed, treat her so nice and make her a nice little card or write her a little letter or draw her a picture. I love getting pictures from my kids. That's one of my favorite things. Okay. These ladies here, these are the moms of Southside. I'm going to move myself around here a little bit so you can see everybody. These are the moms. These are a bunch of moms and in our church lovely ladies that um, help us, nurture us, are mentors to us. These are the moms of Southside. So just have a look. If I have missed any of the moms on Southside, I want you to know that we are including you in this as well today. So here's our prayer for you. Let's all bow our heads, okay? Thank you, God, for this time to talk about moms, very important people in our lives. Moms who are there for us, moms who are there just in, in spirit and in kindness and love. And maybe we don't see them every day. Maybe we, we can't talk to them every day. But God, please, please put a special blessing on all of the women of our church. Please bless every single one of them. All of the hands and feet that are helping, that are making meals for people when they need it, that are prayer warriors. God, I just ask for this special blessing on all of these, these women. And God, I ask that you um, bless these children who are listening to this message today, that you surround yourself around them and give them the strength and give them the, 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 the knowledge and let them hear this message today and let them just be kind people and, and treat people like they are blessed, like they are honored. We are all people of God. We are all children of God. And we ask God that you let us feel that, let us know that. And I ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for listening to me today. And I ask you to have a wonderful week and happy Mother's Day, everybody. Good morning. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. The kingdom, the power and the glory belong to you forever. Amen. Lord, today we think about our mums. And we ask that you will help us to show them gratitude in our actions and the things that we say. Lord, we think of those mothers who can't be with their children and those who can't be with their mums. And we ask that you will give them comfort on what may be a difficult day. We think of those in our Southside family and those we know personally who are having issues with their health. We ask that you will give wisdom to the doctors and the carers who are spending time with them and that you will give our friends and family a peace at this difficult time. Lord, we thank you for our first responders and for those people who are on the front lines, ensuring that we have food and other things that we need. Lord, we ask that you will keep them safe. And thank you, Lord, for those who are in authority. We ask that you will give them wisdom and guidance as we are able to reopen following this shutdown, that we will be able to stay safe and that in our actions as well, we will keep each other safe. Lord, as we bring our offerings now, we ask that you will multiply them and give us wisdom in how they should be used, that they will further your kingdom and help those who are in need. 
We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're back to Abraham and Sarah, and particularly this morning, I want to talk about Sarah on Mother's Day. Do you ever find yourself in the middle of someone else's story? Maybe we could also say someone else's mess. That's maybe more like it. That you didn't plan to be where you are, but someone else's story or someone else's mess has landed you in a situation where you kind of throw your arms up and say, how are we going to get out of this? So as we go back to the story of Abraham, and particularly the story of Sarah, um, I want to talk about how Sarah navigated in the middle of someone else's story. And actually, specifically, in at least one instance, someone else's mess. So a little tongue-in-cheek this morning, I want to take you to a verse in the New Testament. And those of you with discerning minds will ask yourselves what in the world is he going to try to talk about on Mother's Day from this verse. So let me read it to you 
and um, from there we will segue on to the life of Sarah. Here's what we find in 1 Peter. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So this would be a bad time to turn off the service, all right? I'm, I'm not, not going to um, cajole women to be calling their husbands Lord. Although it'd be all right every now and then if, if they chose to. But what, what was really interesting to me, just a, totally aside on this, if, if in your Bible it's the same as mine, there's a little reference in the middle of this text that sort of takes you back to when she called him Lord. And I don't, and obviously this is all that Peter had at his disposal. So he's saying on the basis of what he knows from the written story, the written narratives of Abraham and Sarah, this is what Peter has seen. And for some reason, he goes to this example in Sarah's life. And I went back and had a look. And do you know when it was that Sarah called Abraham Lord? She called him Lord while she was laughing to herself at the message that she was going to have a son. So they'd had this visit from angelic beings with God's message to them, and it was a confirmation um, after the very first promise, quite a while later, where the message from God came to Abraham and Sarah, you're Sarah will have a son. And and the passage says that Sarah laughed when she heard that. And and here's the commentary back in Genesis. She laughed when she heard that she was going to have a son. And it says this, Imagine this, when I am old, and my husband is ridiculously old. My Lord is ridiculously old. My my Lord is is old and we're going to have this pleasure that's the hebrew term so i think maybe peter was also sort of tongue-in-cheek about this whole thing so here's sarah and she is referring to abraham as her lord but not in the context in which it is is sort of interpreted and applied in peter she is laughing to herself and saying you know this old guy, my lord, um, I, I don't think so. So, so take that for what it's worth. Um, call your husband lord if you must, if you like, and we'll be all good. So let me go back with you to the story of Sarah, because this whole matter of her being an older woman, and Abraham indeed being even older than she was, is kind of at the heart of the 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 miraculous working of God in bringing about his great purposes and plan and story um, through the history of Israel and in, into the rest of the covenant relationships of the Bible. Um, as we think about Sarah and Abraham, we, we go with them on this little journey, long journey, and it, it was a journey full of kind of um, mess-ups, if you like. Uh, I mean, there were conflicts. There were conflicts among people around them. There were conflicts um, that came to them and because of them. And one of the parts of the story is, is very interesting. And here's the, the whole idea about being caught up in someone else's story. There was a king called Abimelech, and... So in, in that time, that, that would have been sort of like, you know, um, a lord in a region, um, kind of a, a, a city king over a region. And Abraham and Sarah were, were passing through his territory. And Abimelech saw Sarah and thought she was beautiful. Now, you know, come again back to the reality that She's well into her 90s, I guess, by now, right? Uh, so shout out to older, beautiful women. And I could get myself in trouble here if I refer to Annabeth as a beautiful older woman, but not be because I'd be right on one hand and not right on the other hand, and it'd be a typical husband thing. 
you know, uh oh, put my foot in my mouth one more time. So I'll, I'll leave it alone, but it's, it's there as an aside. Abimelech looked at Sarah and thought, she is good looking. And he took her into his home. And as, as all of that happened, um, Abraham had a word with Sarah, and he said, I know they're going to find you very beautiful, so yeah, um, I might come a cropper to this. I mean, he may decide he wants you for his wife, and I'm the problem, so he may just send his hitman after me. So please tell him and all the people around him that you're my sister. Now, it's half true because they had the same father, different mother, something like that. So they were half siblings. So it's kind of a half truth. But what in the world was Abraham thinking? And here is Sarah finding herself in the middle of someone else's mess or someone else's story. So Ab Abimelech takes Sarah into his home and along the way actually God appears to him and says what are you doing this woman is married and Abimelech has a fit so he goes after Abraham and he says what are you trying to do to me you didn't tell me that she's your wife you said she's my sister now fortunately this is um this is a family rated show and that's fine because nothing happened um, that was untoward and so Abimelech did the right thing I mean he did the upstanding thing and he returned Sarah um, to her to her husband Abraham that's not the only time that you know they wobbled into ethical or moral difficulties but imagine being Sarah in the middle of all of this so this whole saga has been about her essentially being an innocent participant in Abraham's story, right? In, in this instance, it's Sarah being dragged into Abraham's mess. And in our lives, I think we sometimes find ourselves in someone else's story or someone else's mess. We, we didn't choose to get there. Maybe it's a good story, and that's great, but maybe it's not such a good story, and, and, and we're sort of thinking, what have I gotten myself into? And if it's a mess, then we really are asking ourselves, what have I gotten myself into? So Sarah, from the very beginning, uh, went along with Abraham. You know, we're not given any part of the narrative that, that has Sarah being... Um, you know, a partner with Abraham in terms of hearing the Lord speak to her and um, knowing the wisdom of what they would do. A Abraham, I, I don't know how he, how he told her all that he needed to tell her, but you, know, you can imagine your husband comes home and tells you some outlandish story and, and says, so let's go. And you say, what do you mean go? I mean, I like it here. I, I finally got my house in shape. I finally got my garden all proper. And why are we going to go? But Abraham um, had had a call from God, and Sarah was brought into his story. I want to talk today about story. And essentially, the, the way that we understand story, first of all, in, in the Bible's setting in the Old Testament versus New Testament setting of the story of the Bible. And then also how our, our own stories need to be understood and need to be um, seen in the light of, of greater things than what the stories themselves might seem to imply or might seem to lead us to. So there are three things about stories. Um, the first thing is about the, the story in the Bible. And then the next two are about our stories and coming from Abraham and Sarah's stories. The first one's a little bit harder to explain. I, I want to be careful to, to say what I, in, what I mean to say. But it's this, that Old Testament stories must be read forwards. So just let that sink in for a moment. The stories of the Old Testament 
need to be read in a forward direction. An example of uh, our propensity to not do that is the recent times when we have seen movements in, in cities and states and so on about changing statues that were part of an embarrassing past. That, that's to say the very least of it. And the rewriting of history, um, because we are terribly embarrassed, ashamed, repentant over what that history was all about. And so we would rather sort of expunge the pages of history. And maybe we can do it by removing the icons, removing the symbols of our wrongdoings in the past. We can do that, um, but I think at some point we are better to say it was what it was, uh, and, and it is what it is. What we did then was wrong-headed, or, or much, much more than that. But we did it. And we look back with all of the understanding that we presently have, with all of the values that we have now developed, with all of the commitments that we have begun to make, um, we look back from that point of view and were horrified at the us of the past. The revisionism of history is really, really tricky. And possibly the better thing would be to acknowledge, uh, in a sense, to, to note, to record the errors of the past, uh, and then say, but now is now, and here's what we will do, or even what we would have done. Um, do you remember the little toy cars? They, I, I don't know if you can get them anymore. We're much more sophisticated now. But you used to be able to take one of these little cars and hold it on the floor, and then draw it back, and as as you have drawn it back, you hear something rev up, and when you let go, the car goes forward. That's, that's maybe an illustration of this, that, that the way we read Old Testament history is only uh, um, as accurate as it needs to be when, when, when we pull back, what we intend to do is let it move forward. So that's why I mean I want to be clear about what I'm saying here. Some of the stories of the Old Testament are horrifying. And for, for many people, it's a struggle to accept those stories because we think, how, how in any way could that have been part of the behavior or commands or... or um, you know, even requirements of, of a God of love. I mean, so when we try to be revisionist with the Old Testament story, we're doing the same thing that we do as we look back on our own more recent history. And we're looking back with the full sensibility of who we are now. And theologically, biblically, spiritually, we look back on the narrative of the Old Testament with New Testament eyes. We look back and we have a hard time um, lining up the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament. Because we look at the stories of the Old Testament with New Testament eyes, which is in, in some way very appropriate, but it, it is wrong-headed when we expect that what we are taught in the New Testament was the understanding, was this, the sort of the progress or the station of the story of God and us through all of time. So if we go back to the Old Testament, we need to watch the events of the Old Testament as they 
progress into something more in the New Testament and very, very often something far, far better. And, and you can't go back. You, you can't read it the other way. You can't um, impose on the narrative of the Old Testament the values of the New Testament. So in, in a very simple way, if we look at the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and we look at what was required uh, to make a sacrifice, just, just a simple animal sacrifice, we need to understand that that may to us seem to be a barbaric thing in some way or, or maybe a superfluous thing. And yet there seemed to be a fixation on that in, in the religion of the Old Testament and in, in the Yahweh worship of the Old Testament. When we push forward into the New Testament, we find that the meaning of those events is in the fulfillment that comes by Christ. And so that which in the Old Testament in situ or in, in its own place or context might look as though it's unnecessary, maybe redundant, maybe even silly. When we find the fulfillment in the New Testament, then we can kind of go back and say, oh, oh, I get it, I get it. But we, we don't go the other direction, right? We, we don't go back and, and say we need to travel that way in that regard. So for those of you who, who struggle with how the Old Testament seems to be so different from the New Testament, um, let me encourage you to always understand the Old Testament as you understand what became of the story of the Old Testament as it was fulfilled in various ways, in, in, even in the later Old Testament, into the New Testament, particularly through the life of Christ and into the life of, of the church. The second thing, and that first thing may occasion some questions on your part, and I am very happy to answer questions about that. Send me an email, um, send me a text, make a phone call, and I'd be happy to chat with you. I'll tell you this. A book that I've been reading for the last several months is called Faith After Doubt, and in that book, Brian McLaren talks about how, how our faith often sort of um, moves, sort of transitions from one stage to the next. He talks about it beginning in a, a, a kind of understanding that we would say is simplicity. And then he says as we get older in our faith, or even older in our, our, year, in our years, the simplicity of what we've believed becomes a little bit more. It's, it's more like complexity. So hmm, maybe it's not quite that simple. It's a bit more complex. That's what life's like anyway. The third stage is perplexity, where we scratch our heads and we say, it was better when it was simplicity because now this complexity, the more it sort of gathers moss like a a stone rolling, the more it, it becomes perplexity for me. I, I'm more and more confused. And after that, he talks about moving into what he calls faith expressed in love, and that's a whole other talk. But I've spent a lot of my Christian life and, and studies and so on in perplexity, and in many ways I'm still in perplexity. And for many people, just this one aspect of our perplexity can trip us up. The Old Testament, just um, in, in terms of its its narrative and history, um, it, it just makes us scratch our heads. So I would just su suggest to you that what I'm suggesting here is is a little bit of my attempt to to deal with that perplexity and say, here's how we can find faith. Um, even when we're perplexed by uh, the God of the Old Testament, the, the, the various ways that we seem to see him characterized and behaving. But the second thing, uh, and here moving more into the story of Sarah in the middle of someone else's story and us in the middle of someone else's story and mess, and it's about us, it's, it's about the stories 
of our own lives. And in many ways, that's what anybody's life is. It's a story. And so the second thing I want to say about stories in this regard this morning is to suggest to you that broken stories can be dealt with in only one way. Broken stories can be embedded in a better story or a bigger story. And I think learning that is, is the space of great personal growth, um, great understanding in, in our relationship with God and, and with one another. Many of us have broken stories. And we wonder, how can those broken stories be fixed? I, I have sat over the years many times listening to people's broken stories, and they break, they break my heart. Uh, stories of abuse, stories of hurt, stories of disappointment, stories of failure. Um, and, and they're heartbreaking, these stories. And you sort of have the sense of a person just longing for their story either to be erased or um, forgotten somehow. And I, I think the right perspective is to say that there's only one way that a broken story can be dealt with, and that is by embedding it in a bigger story, a better story. The, the big story the the great story the meta narrative of our lives and of our existence and of humankind is is god and in particular god's character so w whatever the aspects are of my broken story what will i do with that story um to change its terms and outcomes i i i can't do much unless I see how it is or I come to the point of seeing that that story needs to sink into a bigger story. And I think for many, many of us, we will only perceive the bigger story later on, on down the road of life or maybe not even until after this life has come and gone. Because the truth of the Christian religion is that there is a bigger story than any of us is, is living or telling. And that is the story of God. And I know that the only time that I've been able to, to even get a, a handle on a broken story in, in my life or someone else's is to look beyond the story and say, what is God's story? in the middle of, of all of this. And, and the story of God is always the story about his love. I, I can't find anything in the scripture that says the thing that's more important about God than love is. Um, we are told in, in you know clear, clear terms, God is love. And so the big story that I know is out there is the story of God's love. And God's love and that story is the only place that a broken story can find its healing, can find its mending. And all of the broken stories of this world and this life um, can only be grasped with, with a sense of hope in the context of God's big story, God's better story. Even the things that are happening in our lives today, knowing that in the middle of the pandemic of, of this year and, and months longer, there's a bigger story than this, and it's the story of God's love. How does the story of the pandemic find its, its um, end or its, its, its solution in the big story of God's love, I, I don't know. I think I'm, I can begin to see here and there there are ways that God's love uh, is beyond the experience of the pandemic. 
over the last few months, we've been heartbroken over uh, the situation in Ethiopia and the Tigray people. And the reports just continue to get worse. And yet, behind that, somehow or other, the big story is the story of God's love. That God is a God of love, and he will, he will bring to fruition what was happening even in the midst of tragedies in people's lives. It may well be after we have moved on from this life that, that then we're able to see that God's love was transcendent, that God's love was bigger than the tragedies, the, the brokenness along the way. And we see that it, it takes God a long time. It takes God all of human history to, to deliver his love. And, and that's why the message about the love of God through the death of Christ for our sins is not incidental. It, it's, an, it's a key part of God's great story of love. Because as God looks at all of the brokenness of our lives, there's one reason for brokenness. It's sin. Sin is the fact that we are out of sync with God. We have, have turned our backs on him. And, and also we, we just can't be the kinds of people and live the kinds of lives that would be necessary to meet up with, with the, the standards that even we would have for ourselves and we imagine God must have for us. And so through all these thousands of years, God has been at work telling his story. And his story is a story of love. And every broken story um, can only find its healing, temporary or permanent, in, in the story of the love of God. Because God's existence and God's character of love are the stories that transcend all of the broken stories of our lives. Even Sarah's story of trying to deal with the mess-ups of her husband's life and behavior find their fulfillment in the character of God and the purposes of God that Abraham and Sarah never understood even through the, the, the years of their lives, you know, long lives though they were. It was long after that um, history could tell the story and the, the revelation of the New Testament could say what God was doing. So we've thought about that even particularly through the children's stories, that it was all of the stars of heaven not being in number able to, to, to count the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, all of the sand on the seashore not being you know, enough, even if we could count it, to, to enumerate the, the descendants of, of Abraham. So God's story was way bigger than the story of Sarah and Abraham. And so there's the example of, of Sarah's life for us. And what Peter does say is that it, she, it's when we are able to live without succumbing to fear that we can please God and, and we, we can somehow have an understanding of, of the work of God and the story that God is crafting and the story that God is telling. Old Testament stories have to be led, read forward. Broken stories can be embedded in a better story. And finally, many stories are not over yet. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that in some ways because so many of us, when we're in the middle of our own broken story or we're in someone else's story, uh, we would like it to be over quickly. We'd like it maybe to be over soon. And, and the fact is that many, many stories are not over yet. God has not finished what he is doing. He has been incredibly patient with us, and he has taken the time uh, to craft a story, to tell a story that finally will be proven to be a story of his love. Uh, we may even struggle to see how it is that the broken stories of our lives and our existence could ever mount up to being part of God's story of love. And yet, that's the big story that we, we appeal to, that, that we lean on. 
and many stories are not over yet. You have stories. You have stories that are perhaps someone else's story that you didn't want to get involved in or maybe you did choose to be involved in. Um, m maybe the stories are stories of a, a mess that has been made in someone else's life that you now are somehow part of and trying to find your way out of. Take heart. Because when Sarah realized where she was and who had taken her, what do you think was in her mind and in her heart? This king, this maybe violent king, that would have been the way of the day, this violent king has, has taken her from her husband, and her husband has been the kind of weak person that says, let's tell a lie to save my skin. Sarah came to herself, I'm sure, and said, how in the world is this ever going to get fixed? And yet, her story was not over. Her story was not even over when her life ended. Her story is not yet over because God is still working through what he began in the lives of Abraham and Sarah. Your story is not over yet. The thing you've been praying for for many years that hasn't been realized, the story's not over. That person you're praying for, the story of that person's life is not over. And you need to hold on. Don't be afraid. Hold on and let even that story be a story that you embed in your confidence that God is and that God above all else is a God of love. And he will prove at the end that every way that he has shaped the story that you are part of has been a way of love because of what he wants for you. God bless. Standing on this mountain top
in about 15 minutes, we will open up a Zoom call when uh, you can come and join with us, you can chat with us. If maybe something I said this morning um, has a question for you in your mind, um, feel free to come and ask that question. Let's chat about it together. And then at, at noon, we will sort of pause for a moment and we will take communion together. So we'll look forward to that on this Mother's Day.